Thank you very much. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for coming along. It's a very, very big room. It's a lot bigger room than I'm used to speaking in. Um, start off a little bit about me. Uh, I've been involved in the open source community for about 20 years now. Um, since I was a teenager and discovered this Linux thing was a bit cooler than that Windows thing. Um, I work at Puppet Labs. I run the operations and professional services group there. Uh, I'm an author. I've written five technical books, um, mostly about Linux, sysadmin, and open source sort of things. I'm a big geek. Uh, my wife would say uh, very much a big geek. Um, I'm known to buy every single gadget that appears on the market. Um, I usually buy two of them um, and break them fairly quickly. Uh, I should warn you, I do talk funny. I'm from Australia, where, and, and pretty much every, every other part of the English-speaking world doesn't believe we speak English. Um, so uh, if you find anything you can't understand, or find that I'm talking very quickly, wave your hands frantically in the air and go, please slow down. OK. Not a good sign. I'm also a whinging bastard. Um, I've spent a lot of years in operations, um, uh, working in, in some big shops, and uh, I'm well known uh, for, for complaining about things. Uh, I don't like um, things that are broken. I'm, I'm a firm believer in perfection. Uh, I don't think you can achieve perfection, but you can get a bloody well of a long way towards it. So what's DevOps all about? Um, this is a topic that, that comes up a fair bit. Uh, you know, and I don't think there's a clear answer to it yet. So DevOps is about cooperation for me, cooperation between development teams and operations teams. And particularly important as to why Belgium is so important for DevOps is because the gentleman who coined the phrase DevOps, Patrick Dubois, uh, is, is obviously from Belgium. And uh, Chris, uh, and I'm going to stuff his surname up, um, Bayart, uh, also heavily involved in the original DevOps movement. So the, pretty much the original DevOps sort of thinking emerged out of a, a bunch of people in Belgium sitting around, I think, drinking beer, which may have something to do with it, while they felt the sort of love for one another. Um, and uh, generally, the, the whole, um, I guess, the whole movement emerged out of sort of a, a bunch of Northern European sysadmins. Um, so what comes up when you start to look at DevOps? So I, I did a little bit of a, a, a keyword cloud, and I'm afraid that the bit top bit's cut off there. Um, the, some of the, the, the phrases that come up when you look at various blog posts around DevOps. And I, I look at these sort of things and I go, well, you know, what has this become? Is this some kind of buzzword bingo where you know, after, after, a few, uh, after a few phrases you all, all get sit around together and go, well, we can talk about DevOps and cooperation and ITIL and we can talk about um, you know, cross-functional teams and, and then everyone, somebody can sort of sit in their meeting and go, bingo, you know, we've managed to parrot out all of the appropriate corporate phrases and phraseology. Um, is it a pop culture movement? Are, are we a bunch of fly-by-night guys who are just uh, trying to con you into buying something? Um, I've seen a couple of products so far that claim they're DevOps compliant. I I'm not sure who they were certified by, um, but if they buy me beer, I'm happy to, um, or, or bourbon, even better. Um, I, I don't think we're a pop culture movement. Um, I also don't think that um, uh, we're, we're going away in a hurry, and, uh, but I do have some caveats before I, I, I talk a bit further. So it's very early days. So DevOps is probably about two years old in terms of, uh, in terms of its, its sort of thinking, and it's probably only about six months old in terms of people actually sort of, I guess, more theori sort of theoretically considering all of the possibilities that DevOps implies. So, Largely speaking, the, the first conversations about DevOps happened about two years ago. Um, I think last year they had a, a DevOps dinner uh, at FOSDEM, and I, I believe there was about 10 or 15 people there. Um, last night they had the same thing again, and there were 60 people. So it's, uh, it's early days. Um, no one has all the answers. I, I don't think anyone's suggesting that it's a fixed movement. We certainly don't have a, a, a manifesto or a, a, a style guide that says, you know, this is how you recognise it's DevOps. It's painted green and it's got little stripes. Um, that that's not the case. Nothing's fixed in stone. We're certainly not. Um, I'm certainly not advocating a position that, uh, um, you know, that, that, that there's a, some sort of doctrinal approach that we need to take. Um, and at the moment, for me, this is all about outreach. It's trying to get a message about out about what DevOps is and about the community around DevOps. Um, and you may notice a little footer on my thing. All opinions my own may be subject to change with added alcohol. I think a lot of the DevOps movement has has been about discussion about people going well. DevOps is a bit of this, it's a bit of that, um, and you know, let, let's, see, let's see how this all fits together. 
For me, um, I like lists, um, and DevOps for me is about, is about four things. Uh, simplicity, relationships, process, and continuous improvement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, each of those areas and, and why they're sort of important to me and why I think they're an important part of DevOps and why I think DevOps, that makes DevOps useful uh, to both operations and development communities. Um, firstly, simplicity. So we all work in, you know, if you work with IT, then IT is complex. Um, you know, the simple things, some of the simple things, you know, that, that in, a, in, a, in an IT shop, you know, the, the how you build your application stack, what particular operating system you choose, can cause a massive amount of debate. I'm not even going to uh, talk about things like um, if I sat down and said to you, Vim is the best editor in the world, then all the Emacs people would be stoning me. Um, and it's a, not an uncommon phenomenon in the IT world to have hugely complex applications linked together uh, based on choices that you have to inherit from somewhere, legacy applications. Um, and in order to manage those environments, simplicity is the key. So you need to choose things that are simple and easy to manage. Um, those things need to be repeatable and reusable. It's, it's particularly, um, particularly in environments where you're managing thousands of hosts. You, you cannot do something that is a one-off thing anymore. You can no longer get away with saying, all of my, my systems are unique snowflakes, and they're all, all different, and they need a different set of rules. You simply do not have the bandwidth or the time to manage a thousand systems that you are considering to be unique snowflakes. And simplicity implies easy to communicate. Whatever message you need to communicate about your systems, whether it be their state, whether it be their configuration, whether it be you know, how to recover them or back them up or secure them, it needs to be something that's simple and easy to communicate. The, the key for me around this is that um, if you're sitting in, the, if you're sitting in the end, at the end of the day, if you're sitting in a room full of people doing a, uh, trying to fix a bug or doing an outage, you want to have the best possible conversation with somebody where the end result is that you solve the problem as fast as possible and you solve the problem in such a way that it never reappears again. And if your environment isn't simple and repeatable, then you're going to have a lot of struggle with that. The next thing for me is relationships. So we all, we all work in, a, in an industry that's well known for the fact that we're sort of supposedly misanthropic. Um, we're supposedly this uh, bastard operator from hell types, we sysadmin types, and we're the ones you, you pick up the phone and call them and you go, they're going to blame me for breaking something or the dev, dev team is going to actually, you know, he's going to cry out and say, uh, here's, here's the guys that, you know, they've, they've, they can't install our, our latest version of the application and they hate us and, you know, we cause them all their problems. Um, but every single thing that we do in, in the IT world is, 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 built, is built around a relationship with other people. Um, too many of the, the conversations I've had over the years in IT have, have consisted of, um, you know, what, what I like to call the blame storm. So the blame storm is, is where instead of ascertaining what the actual problem is, the first thing you do is work out who can I blame for the problem and who can I make sure, how can I make sure it's not my fault? And there's a, a famous American phrase, cover your ass. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's an expression that gets quite a used, used quite a lot in, in enterprise IT shops, is that you're attempting, attempting to, rather than solve the problem, you're attempting to be the person that, that, that is, is not at fault. Um, the only way to change that mentality, to change that, that conflict between teams, um, is to build relationships. Um, and there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reading you can do about how to build relationships, and a lot of it's touchy-feely stuff. And, I, I now work in America where everyone talks about their feelings all the time. Um, I'm Australian, we don't. Uh, we just get drunk and hit things. Um, but, but generally speaking, um, it's about engagement uh, and it's about engaging early and often. So if you imagine the life cycle of a project, life cycle of a project consists of, um, you know, if you, if you work in a business and the business says, we would like to build a, a product uh, or a service and that product or service is gonna, it's gonna talk to a new bunch of customers. And the marketing team, you know, come up with a marketing message and they come up with a, the business comes up with all the things they want to do. They throw over a sort of, you know, maybe a few scratchings on a, on a, on a cocktail napkin that the marketing guys came up with between strippers and, and then hand it over to a bunch of developers. And the developers go, we can't build this, it's impossible. That's their first reaction almost every time. Um, they next go, okay, we can build this, but it's going to look a bit like this. Um, they then build the application, you know, th there's a whole bunch of people sitting around and they go, this is really cool, we should use React here. That NoSQL stuff's really cool. Uh, and then someone says, oh wow, we better make sure that it runs on this and we better make sure it runs on the latest version of Ruby. Um, and oh my god, we can use this really cool library I found and let's install all of these gems and vendor them in here. And, and all of a sudden, and I'm, not, I'm picking on Ruby people because I'm a Ruby person, but um, it, it's true of almost every environment. Um, 
The next step that happens is that, is that the team you know, puts together this amazing demo and they demo it for the marketing people. The marketing people say we hate it. They hire a couple of UI people and fix that. And then the application people say we're done. Hand it over. Let's toss it over the fence. And the people are handed over to operations people. And the operations people take one look at it and go, oh my god, how are we going to make this work? It doesn't run on our standard operating system. It requires all these libraries we don't have. Um, how do we back it up? Oh my god, it's, it's syncing data between three data centers across four continents. And, and how do we secure it? The application architecture is completely different from our existing application architecture. And they model through. They spend six weeks trying to work out all of the bits and pieces. They jury rig things. They write scripts. Um, they build systems that, you know, especially unique systems, this stick application. They run it up. First day, it goes under some load, and it falls over. There's, a, there's then, you know, we've all sat in that meeting where the system's fallen over, you know, the, the, there's 10,000 concurrent connections and the developers say it should support 10,000 concurrent connections, you guys haven't provisioned enough systems, you guys haven't worked out how to, how to handle this problem. And everybody sits around and, they, and basically it's an exercise in trying to ascertain whose fault it was um, rather than how, fixing the problem and trying to ascertain, uh, you know, how, how, do we get, how do we get here and, and how do we get out of the hole. The, the key to getting out of that hole is instead of right back at the very start where the business has a particular need, the business says we want to create something. The people they should have gone have a conversation with are both developers and operations. And if those people are in the same room having that conversation, then all of these little things which are called in IT world non-functional requirements. So non-functional requirements are little things like security and backing things up. Um, and they're equally as, and ironically called non-functional, but equally as important to the process of, of building an application. So both, if we start from the beginning where both sides actually have a conversation, actually get involved and talk to one another, then we, we actually have an opportunity to develop a, applications and products where everybody gets something out, gets what they want out of it. So how do we do that? Um, to, start, to start to do that, both sides need to have detente. Um, and uh, my French accent is terrible. Um, it sounds much better when you actually have a French accent. Um, but detente is about both sides need to understand that they're all in the same problem. We're all in the same problem space. We all have the same issues we have to deal with. Um, we all have the same, you know, the same bosses, the customers. Um, we all work for the same people. We all get paid the same way. Um, we need to actually get um, stuck into a, a conversation with one another where we actually don't let our, our prejudices sort of colour the conversation. And you have to have that conversation. You can't send someone an email. That I, I, I find the, the classic example of uh, you know, someone is wrong on the internet. And the reason someone is usually wrong on the internet is because someone has written an email and someone else has read the email and gone, oh, I interpret it like this, or I speak English as a second language and I've read this email in a particular way, or I miss the smiley face he stuck at the end of that. And next thing you know, somebody's having a conversation that consists of, of we're actually aggressively pursuing a, a point rather than actually having a, a, a dialogue. Um, and uh, I can't underestimate to you the number of times that I've solved simple problems by getting off my ass, walking halfway across a room, or getting onto a video conference and actually talking to the person involved. Um, and building those relationships is a key part of, of, any, of, the, of any of the steps that, that we need to talk about in DevOps. So the next important thing for me is process. So I've spent, I spent about um, watching the IT industry change dramatically over the last sort of 20 years. When I first started, the one system we worked on was a massive big mainframe partitioned into sort of you know, production and development. There was a DRP mainframe. Um, and there was pretty much, you know, we had a system and it did stuff. Um, there was no client server. There, was no, you know, there were dumb terminals. Um, I started to cut my teeth on 34, 3470 green screens, 3270 green screens. That's changed dramatically. We went from a, a world where all of a sudden client server appeared. We had, you, you were no longer managing one big system. You were managing thousands of small systems. Throw in virtualization. Throw in the cloud, if, you, if you're happy with the, the term the cloud. Um, and all of a sudden, individual sysadmins have gone from saying a 1 to 50 relationship with machines to a 1 to 5,000 relationship with machines. That's simply not scalable. Um, I don't know how many hours, how many hours people spend um, uh, doing sysadmin stuff back in the day, but certainly these days you literally, I, I don't know a sysadmin who isn't overworked. Uh, I don't know a sysadmin in a big shop who isn't constantly looking at, at new technologies, constantly having to look at, at new challenges, new products, um, and having to deal with projects in, 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 you know, far more projects than that they're used to handling. The only way to handle that is automate. Um, 
I cannot, under, I cannot um, underemphasize the importance of automation. You know, the only way you're going to scale up to those sort of environments is, is to actually manage to all of the things that you, you do should be done at a, the click of a button. The other thing is, is built-in redundancy and the expectation of failure. Um, for me, the, 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 the classic example of this is, is that the, the business comes along and they say, we, would want, we want 99.999 availability. Um, and it needs to be redundant across all of our data centers. And if anything goes wrong, it needs to be up within an hour. That's uh, whatever our SLA happens to be. Um, and then they say, you know, uh, we want this magnificent Rolls-Royce solution, but here's a budget that borrows you a Morris Minor. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that we all have to deal with. Um, so my assumption is that instead of starting from the position of let's build the, the best possible, let's build the, the, the most wonderful architecture in the world, let's build the thing, let's make the assumption that let's build from a, a concept of this is going to fail at some point. So have the expectation of Build, around, build, your proce build your process and your tools around the assumption that things are going to fail and you need to build redundancy around them. Um, the, key, next, the key part of, of doing that is to test things. So don't, don't do your, your, your testing at, at, at the, the last moment of your, of your operation. Assume that, that, that at any point in time you should be able to pull the plug and say, this is, this is, this is broken, this is gone, um, what's happened? How do, I, how do I resolve this problem? So the, the, the next... The key part of that is understanding that, that um, if this is in a failure state, how did it get there and how do I reverse it? So you have the processes and the, and the automation to say, if it fails, this will, this will automatically make it heal it, make it better again. Um, the other thing too is that remember that process is, is process and, and, and the, the various processes and steps in, across both themes, both development and operations, is all part of the same life cycle. So all part of the experience of um, of running an IT environment, it's not the you know, so if the development team is doing testing in their development environment, if they're if they're deploying applications, then the overall overall it's part of an overall life cycle that ends with that application going to production. So any process you build should be something that should be transparent and open to everybody. Um, the key around that is tooling. Um, and this is where the open source community has really come to the fore in, in the DevOps sort of scene. And the reason that, 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 that it's so prevalent in the de in open source community is that there are tools like Puppet and CF Engine and Chef in the configuration management space, Control Tier, Run Deck, um, M Collective, uh, monitoring tools, security, testing. Um, a number of people, I think, believe Lindsay Holmwood, who uh, came up with um, Cucumber Nagios, talked here last year about that. Um, these are all perceived as ops tools. And the reason that, that, that I, I put the ops in the question mark is that the value you get from having, the, having these tools is not limited to operations teams. Development teams uh, have a key stake in, in, in building these tools. And, and, the, and the important part, for example, that we, we cite as an example of, of why I use Puppet is that if an application developer can build a Puppet manifest or a chef cookbook or a CF engine recipe, and they can actually d deliver that, that recipe from, from life cycle to its end. So they, they've cut their code, they've built their associated puppet module or their chef cookbook, uh, and it ships all the way through the life cycle. So it gets, it gets the application development team hand that over to a testing team or hand that over to a production operations team um, who actually implement that live. And it means that you actually have that, that cooperation, have those things like, you know, we are building the infrastructure, we're building, this is how the DNS looks, this is how the backups work, this is how you secure things all the way through that life cycle. Um, deployment and orchestration, um, you know, application teams, particularly, for example, big Java shops, there's a very, there's a very clear way they like to deploy, uh, and, 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 and deploy and orchestrate applications. There's an important opportunity for developers and operations people to work together with those tools and actually understand um, what the particular requirements the development team has and what the requirements the operation team ha have and why those are, 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 are important. The other thing is things like monitoring and testing is they're not, they're not solely limited to, to one group or another. So the sort of data that, that you make available for your monitoring environment is, is a key piece of data that most of your application developers need to understand the troubleshoot problems. So if you actually go and ask them questions about what they want to monitor, what do they want to see, the end result is something that you can both work with and both use. Um, sorry, excuse me. The other piece of this is there are lots of things developers do that are useful to operations people. So smart sysadmins for a long time have been version controlling things, you know, uh, everything ranging from DNS configurations to, to 
to whatever happens to be that, that, that changes state you want to keep track of. Um, the last couple of years, you've seen lots more operations. People understand tools like Git um, and, and Bazaar. And the reason they've done that is because there's some useful things developers do about branching, about the way that you can actually, actually have multiple people collaborate on tools and collaborate on configuration and collaboration on code that's useful to both operations people. Following on from that, there's also tool, things like Agile and XP uh, and, and concepts like continuous deployment that have emerged out of the development community that are useful things for operations people to know as well. Um, that's not to say that those, those concepts are perfect, not to say those concepts are things that you should immediately in, in, adopt in your operations team. Uh, John Allspar, from, who was at Flickr and is now at Etsy, um, talks about uh, a number of times about how it, so I have like used to deploy t into production 10 times a day. Now, a lot of people look at that and go, those WebOps guys are fucking nuts. There's no way a stable environment is going, to, is going to be healthy if you deploy 10 times a day into that environment. That may not suit your, your, your particular environment, but the ability to say, go from having a six week deployment cycle, and there's a number of banks and financial institutions and insurance companies that literally go weeks and weeks between deployments because they, it, the process is, uh, of deploying an application is so complex so risky and, and has such a potential to, um, to cause disaster that, that they, they, they're incredibly cautious and risk averse. There's a lot of concepts that come out of that, that agile and continuous deployment things that can be adopted to cut down that time period. Um, application architecture and orchestration. Operations people are classically bad at documentation. Um, I think the, the, you know, the, 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 the only time the network diagram tends to be up to date is usually after the post-mortem. Um, for, for, for an outage. Um, there's a lot to be said for, for the way applications people build architecture, the way that they, uh, they document architecture that operations people can learn a lot from. Another thing is testing methodology. So operations people, this is something that, that's new to a lot of operations people, a concept of, for most operations people, the concept of testing things is monitoring. So is the, is the SMTP port open? Uh, do, is the DNS service running? Um, you know, can, can I, uh, you know, what's the load on this particular machine? Applications people think about testing in a whole different way. They think about testing in terms of, is the application functional? Um, does, the, does the result that I input, um, you know, at, run through this method and output, does that result mean something? And a lot of what um, someone like Lindsay Holmwood has to say, for example, about Cucumber Nagios is about understanding that, that testing things like, is the SMPT service running, is not that important. And the reason it's not important is because it doesn't tell you anything about the functioning of the application. It doesn't tell you anything about what the business value of that application does. The SMTP court can be open, but if it's not sending email, and that email is not shaped the right way, whatever latest marketing blast that, that Oracle is sending out to everybody, if it's not shaped that way, then the, the service is valueless. So you need to take your testing up to another layer, which is test the business functionality. So from a, from an operations perspective, you can learn the lesson, uh, lessons that application developers have, which is that you test the function and you return the result that, that you expect the customer to see. And in the process of testing that function, in order to you know, send a message via that SMP, wow, the SMP port has to be open. So you actually get all of the base level reporting, um, and I'm not saying you certainly turn off the monitoring, but all of the base level reporting, you get that as well, but you also get to understand that the, what the, the customer is expecting to see, what the application is supposed to deliver, actually gets delivered. Um, the last piece I want to talk about is, is continuous improvement. Um, so in the IT industry, as I said before, we all have customers. The business is our customer. Um, you know, the, the, it doesn't matter what sort of organisation you work in, you have somebody who, who, who consumes the result of what you produce. Um, those people don't stop. Um, asking for things, uh, you know, uh, the, the, when I first started out at, as a sysadmin, you know, I think we fixed a couple of problems and I was really chuffed, I was really pleased, you know, I fixed this problem, it's awesome, you know, the customers have been complaining for months that this thing didn't do what they thought it was doing and it was, it was generating a, you know, a report and they wanted the report by, you know, 7.30 in the morning instead of 8 o'clock and I was really chuffed, I did a bit of fiddling around and I, I you know, the report generated, you know, tweaked some SQL and the report generated much faster and I sat back and I went, I can have a cup of coffee and a cigarette, you know, I've done a really good job. And I, 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 about nine o'clock, I, I got an email going, yeah, we got the report, it looks like this, but now we want it at, 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 at seven because we've actually ascertained that, that, you know, it would be really useful if this particular operations team in this time zone had it. And I'm like, fuck you guys, where's my thanks? Where's my, you know, you did a really good job. You know, where's my pat on the back? 
It never comes because customers are never happy with the end result. They want the next best thing. And fair enough too because they pay your salary and, and you work for them. Um, and I get, a lot of, I get a lot of stick for this um, because I, I'm a firm believer in saying that, that we all deliver a service and the people that pay for that service are entitled to get a, a decent service out of us. Obviously, if they, they, they pay like crap, then you know, that's a whole different thing. But, um, but they, those customers don't stand still. They have requirements that keep changing. Keep, they, you cannot sit back and, and go, wow, we've, we've done something really cool here. That's the last time we have to worry about this. Because they will come back next week and say, well, you've delivered me this. I'd like a little piece more. Products don't stand still either. So um, businesses change. You know, the organisations like banks, you know, I spent a lot of time working in banks. 20 years ago, the concept of online banking, completely non-existent. Now, nowadays, ask most customers to say, uh, you know, write, with exception, notable exception of the United States, writing a cheque is a foreign concept to most banking customers. Uh, as a result, things become far more complex. They don't stand still, and you need to keep on top of delivering things that, that are new, uh, that are changed, um, and that, that, that have unexpected sets of requirements. Technology doesn't, definitely doesn't stand still either. Um, you, you, you have, things like virtualization have come, come for a rude shock to a lot of shops. You know, sysadmins have gone from saying, you know, we can manage a 50 systems like this to managing that 5,000 system model. And your team doesn't stand still either. Um, people get bored. And, and there's nothing worse than, than, than a bunch of people who are, who are bored and disinterested by their jobs. If you provide people with the right sort of challenges, the right sort of, sort of things to learn, uh, then, then you, can, you move forward quite rapidly and, and you're able to, able, if you're able to improve on things, move forward and look at things in, in that sort of continuous improvement light, um, then, it, it, then, it's, a, then it, 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 it's an opportunity for both people to learn and, and people to, to develop. Um, the strike off and strike hard and be aggressive um, is that you can't sit still um, in, in an environment like this. You can't sit still and wait for things to happen to you. So the, the continuous improvement piece needs to be, you know, think about what would go wrong here. Think about the failure you're trying to resolve. Think about the issues you need to deal with um, and, and deal with those first. The more problems you solve up front, the more time you spend um, putting into making things better is the, le is the uh, and my boss Luke Keniz has a, a phrase, the faster you get to the pub. And I'm a firm believer that if you, if you, if you address things aggressively and quickly um, and, and, and actually think about the problems first, you're able to get to the pub much faster. Um, the big thing about, about DevOps for me is that it's a cultural change. It's not a, it's not a, a series of technologies and tools and processes alone. Um, and cultural change is hard. People don't like thinking about things differently. Um, they don't like looking at, at, at things in a new way. Um, the not invented here syndrome is, is, is very strong in a lot of organisations. Um, people hate change, um, even little changes. People don't like little changes in their life. We like routine. We like things to be normal. We like things to be consistent. Um, and as a result, when you make change, people don't like you. So uh, I've worked in a lot of environments where we're introducing changes like DevOps, where we, you know, the, the, the coordination between teams the, the, the first thing that comes out is the why do I have to talk to him? That's the guy that wrote that code that really sucked and I got woken up at four o'clock in the morning with a pager. Um, and as a result, you know, pe people will respond to you in a, in a fairly aggressive way when you make changes like that. That fear of change is largely irrational. Um, it, it's largely a, a, you know, I don't know where, where this is leading. I'm, I'm largely, I'm gonna be concerned about, I'm concerned about my future, where this is leading, what happens to me. Um, the best way to deal with that fear of change is to listen to people, actually have a conversation with them about what's, what they're worried about, what's going on, provide concrete examples of how things help, how things change. Um, I think the, the classic example for a lot of people is, is, is presenting to them, this, is, this solution will actually result in improved availability, will result in a better, better SLA, actually demonstrate how the change will work with them. The other thing is you, is you can't just stand up and say, make pronouncements. So um, uh, as, as a... You have to actually be in the guts of things. You have to actually be solving problems, actually be part of the problem, um, part of the solution rather than the problem. Uh, the worst thing in the world for, for any IT shop, you know, the, the classic example is, 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 the, is the development team who don't get woken up at four o'clock in the morning, who, who, are, who are able to come in at you know, 10 o'clock or whatever it happens to be, and, and they, get the, they see the ticket and they go, oh, you know, something's broken, oh well. Whereas the development team have been awake for the last five, the operation team have been awake for the last five hours trying to resolve that issue. Um, if you want to make things like cultural change in that sort of space, 
Give developers pages. Make them on call. Make them responsible for service levels and availability that they wouldn't otherwise be. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the responses to the, the DevOps movement. And uh, uh, I, I'm very fond of the classic uh, Danger Will Robinson uh, with Robbie the Robot um, talking, about, talking about what, uh, you know, um, some, whatever unknown danger is around. Um, it's also my favourite Thomas Paine quote. When we're planning for posterity, we ought to remember that virtue is not hereditary. So when I first started out in the IT industry, the guys who taught me about IT ops um, were all in their 50s. They'd all come from that mainframe world. They were very serious guys who were like, availability is the key, big iron is the only way to do it. Um, and the virtues they taught uh, have not passed on. There's a lot of people who come, from, come into the operations and development world with a, with a, very, a very different perception of, of how, how availability, how operations works. Um, you need to actually, actually uh, provide the, that concrete, that concrete um, set of planning in order for people to, to continue, to understand, to continue to understand what's important. So some of the classic responses to, to DevOps that, that have been is good systems, sysadmins have been doing this since they came down from the trees. Um, and for me, this is really, this is really something that, that, that I, I look at in, in fairly bit of horror. There is a very small percentage of the sysadmin community and the development community who look at this stuff and go, we've always done this. And those people sort of go, shrug. As a result of that, I'm not going to make any changes outside of my world. So that other part, that they completely ignore that 85% of the community that has no idea that there are better way of doing things, no idea to, that, that automation will make you free, that, 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 that there are ways of, different ways of looking at things. The next response is that, that you know, my organisation is different, that can't work here. And that, as I said earlier, that whole unique snowflake world, that's gone. There's no, there's no way that you can look at an environment and say, we're going to manage everything differently, we're going to be different from everyone else. Um, that, 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 that thinking is, 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 is something that, that will become, you know, that comes from that whole bastard operated from hell view of the world. And that, that, that's no longer something that's feasible in a, in a modern environment. The next one is it's all about one particular group or the other. So I, I concentrate on operations, I, I, that's the area that I, I work in. Um, and the response here is that, that operations people are, 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 are going to have to become like developers. The developer, we're espousing that development methodology is, is, is the key, for, the way forward. And for me, that's, 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 that's simply, simply not true. The, the, the thing for us is that we, both sides need to learn from one another. So for us, for me, it's understanding that both sides need to actually collaborate, both sides need, can learn from one another. And yes, yeah, someone actually posted you're a bunch of elitist European wankers, which I was a bit horrified by because I'd love an EU passport and I didn't have one. Um, so the other danger is that, that, that ha where DevOps ends up. Um, and for me, the, 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 as I said earlier, there's, there's, there's been a couple of uh, products that have said they're DevOps certified, that, that, that the, 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 new, the new hotness is DevOps and uh, therefore you know, my product does DevOps. Uh, I've also seen Forrester and Gartner both have DevOps events. Um, I know, uh, speaking to Patrick and Chris, neither of them were invited to that. Um, and it's always fascinating when analysts, uh, some of you may understand the analyst market's very soft serving. The an analysts get a question from customers saying, I've heard about this DevOps thing, what's it all about? And they all go around and ask all their questions of their other customers and then feed the result back and it becomes a self-fulfilling loop. The key thing for me is that around, around DevOps and understanding how, how, how to avoid that for DevOps is to make it more than marketing speak. So actually put this thing stuff in practice in organisations to actually solve problems using DevOps concepts, to solve problems by actually making operations and, and develop work better together. Other thing is it's very easy to pay lip service to this. It's very easy to say uh, we're going to have a role called a DevOps person or we're going to have a DevOps team. It's not a role, it's not, it's not a thing you can build a team around. It's about a different way of looking at IT and IT operations. It's also a concept that's very easy to cause disenchantment amongst people, mostly because people are, are uncertain about those changes, they're uncertain about how, how the world will, 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 will change for them in, in, in that sort of DevOps environment. It's very easy for people to lose faith in the organisation that they work for because they, they don't feel that they're going to get anything out of this. Um, and that whole disenfranchisement of people um, is something that, that, that I think every organisation struggles with, and it's something that, that that I think DevOps has a real opportunity to change that, that frustrated mentality that a lot of sysadmins have and the frustrated mentality a lot of DevOps developers have dealing with those sysadmins. 
and that that change is, is around is around that whole learning understanding from, from each other and understanding what's 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 going on um, I've, I've found the last few years that I spend a lot of time cutting code where I didn't used to. I, I used to spend a lot of time writing, writing bash scripts. I now find myself cutting Ruby code, learning things, learning new things, and I get a lot, of, a lot more pleasure out of my role than I did previously. And the last one, anti disestablementarianism I just wanted to put in because I like anti disestablementarianism um, So I think I've, I've spoken very quickly and I, I think rather poorly, unfortunately. Um, but I did want to um, uh, ask if anyone had any questions before we go on. Okay. When you when you look at the role of, of development and operations in your environments, what are some of the tangible things that change about their roles? Like, I, like I know for. Agile principles, for example, I mean, things like between Agile and testing tend to blur the lines. What about in DevOps? Does it change the rela how do, Does it change some of the activities? Does it blur some of the lines between development and operations? So I think classically, um, the whole, I think configuration management is the prime example there. So that the, we used to spend a lot of time doing things like creating users, um, installing packages, um, managing services, monitoring things. Those are not cool things. Those are boring tasks. Um, the thing about uh, that, that DevOps allows is to say, let's take all of that stuff, let's make it automated, let's make it something that we don't have to worry about. Because the really cool thing I'd like to do is learning how to um, scale this particular application, or I'd like to learn how, how the new NoSQL stuff that the developers have introduced works. Um, I think the tangible outcome for, for a lot of organisations is that you get away with, with saying that all the boring shit, the stuff that, that, that has occupied your time um, you know, fixing things, installing things, change, changing basic configuration things that, are, that, that is fairly sort of boring and, and, and monotonous, um, you can actually work on the projects that are actually interesting. Um, the other thing is that being, for, for a lot of organisations, having that conversation with development teams means that you're actually in the guts of the development process. That's far, for me, is a far more interesting activity than sitting around being an operator and, and watching, watching the, you know, the, the, the meters and run it. If you run a whole bunch of people through, through and for example, the, 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 we have, I have a couple of organisations we work for that have embedded operations people into the developer's scrum. You know, they can't necessarily cut the same code, but they're part of the actual development of the application. By the time the application gets to production, those guys are like, this is really cool. And they become evangelists for the, for the application that's developed. Not only do they, they understand the application better, uh, they understand the metrics and the basic concept that developers put into the, the thing, but they actually care about it. Um, and I think that's a really important I've seen too many applications that get thrown over the fence and you go, I don't really understand what this does, um, you know, I don't understand why it breaks all the time, I don't understand why it performs like shit. Um, but if you're actually involved from day one, you can go, well, then we made a compromise here. We actually decided to do it, wire it like this instead of this because of this particular reason. And you go, we can make it better like this, this, and this, but here's the, the caveats we had. I think a lot of that sort of knowledge is not, you know, that sort of, inst that sort of knowledge is not something that gets passed on otherwise. Um, when will your big and explicit book about Puppet will be finished, finally? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I'm hideously jet-lagged, and um, that, that, um, that question has been asked 17 times in the, since I landed on Belgian soil. Um, uh, March or April, maybe? Um, no, um, unfortunately, yeah, I, 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 I think I, I spend about 20-hour days at the moment, and uh, it's almost done. Almost. Two chapters left. Um, and I had the help of a very good colleague who was uh, pushing along, so. Hello. Um, obviously, one of the keys behind DevOps is a better collaboration between the development and the IT operations guys. Uh, coming from the IT operations field yourself, what would you expect from a development team in order uh, for you to relate better to it? What could the developers do to ease your way towards this collaboration? So I, I talked about um, embedding operations people into Scrum and, or into your Kanban or whatever developers do. Do it the other way around as well. So drag development people in, into, into, into incidents and outages. Bring them, if you have an operations stand up, drag the developers in. 
make them understand the sort of problems you have. Um, a lot of developers are, are operate on the principle that, that we've, we've, we've built something, it's really cool, it's really hot, and then we piss off down the pub and, and the operations people have to manage it. If they actually understand that the, the, there are implications and consequences to their choices, um, that, that if they choose a particular application architecture, it is gonna, it's going to have an, imp an impact on the operations team at the end of the day. Um, the number of developers I have a conversation with who go, oh, Oh, you didn't tell us that, that, that you, 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 know, you, you don't do things like this or it's hard to package this or we, this set of Java libraries are like this. Um, if you actually have teams involved on both sides from day one of a project, there's a far greater appreciation for, for how that works. Um, developers also, um, stuff like, developers are, are like, you have a particular operations problem. We spend to be fairly metric-centric people, operations people. We, we're interested in metrics, we're interested in measuring things. Developers are also interested in that sort of thing, and they also have a set of things they'd like to know. When something goes wrong, something's performance, performing badly, um, they, they, they have that, that desire for that information. If you have a conversation with a developer that says, let me tell you about the metrics I have, you can tell me about how your application is instrumented, and then I can tell you how I, what I'd like to have added to that instrumentation, you can tell me what data you'd like from my end. Those sort of conversations are really powerful, and, and I've found that a lot of, um, a lot of developers are, are sort of stunned by the, by the I guess the, the, the depth to which operations people use metrics and, and, and they sort of have underappreciated our, our perception of that. Um, so the, this, I guess there's some, there's some conversations around that that, that are sort of really healthy and, and, and it prom promote that sort of cooperation. Um, so this sounds uh, really interesting and uh, it sounds like what we did actually, what I've done actually in some of the companies I've worked and it's, it works really well, but does it first, does this really scale at all? So does it scale to a bigger team and uh, bigger teams of operations and development people? Because uh, that's one of the main problems when the teams become big enough, it's really hard for them to mangle. Yep. And the other thing is uh, mostly if you've done this, but I have this very weird uh, observation that development people think, for example, that CPU, memory, and hard drives are uh, infinite and most of their resources are infinite, and this is one of the main issues with working with uh, deploy deploying their software, so if you've managed to teach anyone that, that's not exactly right. Um, I, I think the challenge of, uh, and, and I, you cer I certainly, you can see a lot of pushback around DevOps and the fact that it works best in, in small teams, for example. You know, people say, it's much easier to do this if you haven't got, you're not an enterprise and you haven't got 500 people I think that's, it's true, it's easy to have relationships in small teams. Uh, I think the, the larger teams, um, you do things like you move whole groups of people through, through, through different teams and different organisations, you shuffle people around, you keep, you keep people actually, actually learning new things, you don't, you don't silo things. I think that the key mistake people make is you build silos, you build a, a group of people who are um, all the Java developers and you build another group of people that are all of the, the web ops people and then you build another... That, that, that is an un, not only an unhealthy way of, of building teams, but it's a way that, that, that doesn't promote that sort of cooperation and coordination. He's cancelled his question. <laughs> Hi, I have a quick question over here. Um, when would be the exact perfect time to be to start doing DevOps when you're doing a startup? When you're doing a beginning of a startup and you found it yourself, you don't have that much capital. I can't see why, uh, for example, a whole bunch of things are useful, but the whole configuration management and all that might just be a drag in the beginning because you really need to move quick, for, quickly forward in order to get capital and, and, and first clients and angel and whatever. So how would you approach that one? So I, I think, um, I think greenfields, greenfields is far easier. So if you have a Greenfields environment, it's far easier to introduce new concepts. People don't have the it's not invented here or we've always done it this way mentality in a Greenfields sort of environment. Um, I think though there are real advantages to, to looking at something like Dev DevOps in legacy environments. So um, legacy environments, uh, you know, we've all got them. We've all got, um, you know, lots of organisations have, have, you know, th their collection of RHEL 4 machines that have been living there forever and they, they, they can't change or upgrade them. They're, they're a bunch of, of Windows NT machines that they've ring-fenced ring off from the rest of the environment. Um, those things cost lots of money to maintain because they're, they're all sort of, they've become sort of boutique or no one wants to change anything. There's real opportunities in, in that sort of environment to actually, to actually sort of 
if you automate stuff in those environments to save a lot of money and to, and to become a lot more efficient, but it's a lot harder to do because making those changes tend to be, systems like that tend to be sort of very uh, fossilised. They tend to be sort of things that, that, that have the organisations become risk adverse about. We can't change that. No one, no one who works here understands how that works anymore. Um, but as a result, the, op the opportunities there are quite large, but the risks are quite high. But Greenfields is certainly easier. If you're a startup from day one, if, if, if it's, it's the classic example is, is Agile. If you start from day one using Agile, it's far easier to go from a legacy development process to an Agile than going from a legacy to an Agile process. If you start from scratch there. I think there was another. Do you have a guarantee? Nope. I'm in operation myself, and uh, in, yeah, we are in this not uncommon situation where all the applications, or all, all, we, all the applications that, that we are deploying, were not developed in-house. So, is DevOps still relevant, and how do you trigger this cur cultural change about uh, automating things? Because we can only automate some baseline, basic things like. Uh, SSH configuration, VM provisioning, and very basic stuff. All, so, all the rest is too diverse and too complex to automate, to do auto automatic deployment. So um, uh, I deal a lot with customers that have outsourced stuff to India and China, um, and it, it's really interesting. There's, uh, outsourcing, in a lot of cases, gets a, gets a very bad name. You know that that that, that people are, are. It's the lowest bidder. Who's, who's outsourced, you've outsourced your stuff to, and they, and they have no interest in, in quality or changing things. Um, I think it's, 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 that's the wrong attitude to take. The opportunity is there for you to infect those organisations. If they understand, and, and there's a couple of people here, I know there's at least one person here from India who works in a, in a big Indian IT company, who, who actually can tell you that, that those guys are interested in learning new things. They want to work on cool technology, and if you have an opportunity to infect them with a whole different idea about how to do things, I think those things will be picked up. And there's big cultural barriers in any outsourcing arrangement, but I think those are, uh, are also opportunities. Um, and it's also about demonstrating value. So if you can demonstrate that, that it's, it will be cheaper for the organisation to do it a particular way, um, then they're going to jump on that because they want to deliver the service and make a bigger profit. I mean, if you can deliver, you get something out of that, you get better availability, you get a better quality of service, you get a better SLA, and they get to do it cheaper or faster or whatever it is. It's a win-win situation for, for both organisations. Uh, hi. I, I luckily started uh, two weeks ago and I'm responsible for uh, implementing uh, application monitoring uh, in a quite very big corporate Belgian environment, uh, which already says a lot for people who know about that. And um, I'm facing the fact that the, the, the operation people have uh, sold their system to be able to, to participate in that. But on the other hand, uh, they're saying, don't flood us with all your application level events and what the, all the, the business process metrics that you would like to see on the dashboard for the business. Do you have any uh, comment on that or do you just want to show some empathy? So I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question totally, but um, uh, I think, again, it's about, it's about demonstrating what, what so if you demonstrate that, that, that was, the question, was the question, if I, if I can paraphrase, um, you've, you've got, they, they're not interested in looking at the business metrics? They're not interested in looking at the application metrics? Was that... Well, the, the developers and the, the business are, uh, but the, the iOS people, they, they want to limit the number of events that will go through their monitoring systems. So um, the, the, what I, I'm trying to promote is the, to, to help them changing their mind in such a way that they accept that monitoring yeah, should okay. go a bit a higher level. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it is about the demonstrating the, the value of it. So demonstrating that, 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 it's, that monitoring the CPU, the memory and the, and the disk is not, the, is not what's important about the application. What's important about the application is what business results it delivers. Still want to know about the other stuff. But if, 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 if all of those, those metrics are perfect, if all of those dashboards are perfect, but the response time over here and the, the application doesn't do what it's supposed to do, then, then it's, it's not working. So they need, they, you need to demonstrate that, that if they have a picture of that, 
may not necessarily be the same metrics that all the dashboards and the business people look at, but a view of that and how it links to those other metrics that they care about, infrastructure metrics, um, that's, that's, that's a way that, that you can set, say, you, you know, this is the picture your customers get. This is the picture that they're seeing. And, and, and they pay your salaries, they pay all of us, and we have to work together in solving that particular problem or giving that particular view. I think it's probably... I think there's time for one more question. Any more questions here? I assume so. Okay. No? Right. <laughs> Thanks very much.